theyeshiva.net. Today's class is dedicated by Nagar Kahanbash in memory of Adina Bat Yoram, in honor of the yard site on the 15th day of Tevis, and in loving memory and Laelu Nishmat, Lael Dina Bat Ephraim. Tehei Nishmasam Surah Betzer Hachayim. And may their light continue to serve as an eternal source of blessing and inspiration to you, Nagar, and to the entire family, and to all of us and all the Jewish people. Class is also dedicated in loving memory of Zlata, Bas Rebaruch, in honor of her yard site on the 15th of Tevis as well, Tesvav Tevis, Zlata Wurzberger, as her original name was, was born in Sigit in Romania. She lost everybody besides her father in the war. She survived the Auschwitz death camp and would tell stories, incredible stories of people. She helped during that dark era. She emerged from the war and she married Reb Nachem Ben Yaminson. They lived in Montreal where she built and started the first Bikr Chaylam. So this is dedicated in her honor of Zlata Ben Yaminson, Zechrena Levracha, Tehene Shemasa Tzura B'Tzur HaChayim. And thank you for your dedication and friendship. So the big question, or one of the questions one asks in Parsha Shmois, is why did Hashem choose Moshe Rabbeinu to become the leader, the first leader, the shepherd, of the Jewish people. And this was no regular leader, this was a leader who molded them into a people, who liberated them from subjugation, from tyranny, who took a nation of slaves and emancipated them, liberated them, and ultimately would lead them out of uh, Egypt into the wilderness, give them the Torah and shepherd them for 40 years and really create the entire foundation of the Jewish people and of Judaism until this very day. Why Moshe? Why him? The Torah is not explicit. The Torah doesn't say, like Hashem told Noyach, you're the one innocent person in our generation and therefore I have chosen you to be saved in the ark and rescue what is left from civilization after the flood. There's no explicit reason mentioned why was Moshe chosen. The Torah, however, does intimate it by presenting three vignettes, three little stories or big stories about Moshe's life before his uh, experience of the burning bush when he's chosen as the leader of the Jewish people. Three stories, one after the other one, and perhaps in those stories lay at least part of the enigma why Moshe was chosen. But the Medrash does ask the question. And the Medrash goes to the source, to the text, to find at least part of the solution. So I want to learn with you this piece of the Medrash. It's the first source in the source sheets. Medrash Rabbah Shmois Beis Beis. That's Medrash Rabbah Shmois, chapter 2, section 2. Umoisha Hoya Raya. Moshe was a shepherd. That's how the Torah introduces the scene where Moshe is shepherding the flock at Mount Chayriv. That's where he's going to experience the burning bush. Says the Medrash, Amru Rabbi Seinu. Our teacher said, Kishahaya Moshe Rabbein Olav HaShalom Rayet Seinu Shal Yisra B'Midbar. When Moshe was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Yisrael, Jethro, in the desert, in the wilderness. Barach mimenu gdi. You remember the story from school, I'm sure. A goat ran away, or a sheep ran away. Virat zacharov. And Moshe ran after the little sheep. He pursued it. At sheigiyah lechosis, kivan sheigiyah lechosis, nizdamna loy brecha shalmayim v'omad hagdi lishtois. The young sheep, the little sheep, found a brecha shalmayim, a pond of water. 
and the sheep began to drink. Stopped running, stopped to start drinking. Kivan Shigia Moshe Etzloi. When Moshe arrived to this tender animal, Omar, Moshe speaks to the animal and he says, I didn't know that you were running away because you were thirsty. You must be so exhausted, hydrated. Moshe took the tender animal and placed it on his shoulder so it wouldn't have to strain itself to walk back but he carried it on his shoulder for and he was walking with this animal. Amar Hakadosh Baruch Hu. That's when Hashem says, "Yesh l'charachem im lino ktsoyne shel basar v'adam kach chayach at a tiret soyne Yisrael." You have compassion to lead the sheep of a human being, of a mortal human being, of flesh and blood, the sheep of Yisrael. I swear to you that you shall become the shepherd of my flock. My sheep, the Jewish people. And this is the deeper meaning in the description of Moshe. Moshe was a shepherd. It's not just a description about his job, his vocation. His father-in-law hired him or chose him to be the shepherd. It's rather a description of a vocation that would characterize his own inner characteristics, his own nature, his disposition, his dedication, his commitment. Moshe Hayeraya tells us not just what he was doing, but also who he was and why he becomes the shepherd of the Jewish people. Now, I don't want to be a party pooper and ruin a warm and cozy story with which generations of uh, Jewish children have been raised knowing the story about Moshe running after the thirsty sheep. But I think we should ask a simple question. It's a beautiful story. It's a wonderful story. But legally, if I am put in charge of your, of your flock and a sheep runs away or a goat runs away, I am obligated to pursue it and ensure its safety. In fact, we have an entire tractate in Mishnayis and in Gemara called Baba Metzia, and a big section of it is dedicated to the intricate laws known as Shmira or Shimrim. The custodian, the Shimer is the custodian. There are four different types of custodians, one who gets, one who gets paid, one who doesn't get paid. The obligations change. There's the obligation of a renter, there's the obligation of a borrower. But the common thread behind all of them is that there's a certain element of responsibility. An animal has been entrusted to me. I have an obligation to make sure it stays safe. And if not, I'm called a paisheya. That's an act of negligence, and I have to compensate the owner. If you give me a, a little puppy that you have to watch for a few days, you're going away, and the puppy, unaccustomed to my environment, runs out of the house, what's the right thing to do, even if you're not a Moshe Rabbein? <laughs> the right thing to do is to go out and retrieve it. This is called basic, base, this is the basics of ethics. This is the basis of, of, of civilization. Moshe did the right thing. He was entrusted to be the shepherd, which means the custodian of his father-in-law's flock. One sheep ran away. What would you do? What would anybody do? Any mensch would go and find the sheep and bring it back. How does this express such a unique level of compassion? He was a shepherd. This was his duty. It's a nice story. But when you see such behavior, it means he's a mensch, he's responsible. Hashem sees in it something else. He says, you're the one who should become the quintessential Jewish leader. Now, the truth is, Moshe didn't only run after the sheep and bring it home. As we see, he lifted it up. He recognized that it's exhausted. He spoke to it with tenderness and compassion. He empathized with this uh, dehydrated and uh, exhausted, weary sheep. But I think all of us know many, many people, certainly people sitting in this room, who are sensitive to animals, right? Like you, and sensitive to their emotions, and sometimes hypersensitive. We know many people who would lift a little cute 
dehydrated and tired sheep, seeing its pain, seeing its suffering, and trying to offer it some physical comfort. How did this convince the master of the world, or persuade, or show Hashem, that he is the most suited human being to become the greatest leader and teacher of his people for all of history? I want to add one more little question. The Medrash says that when Moshe came to the sheep, he said, oh, I didn't know that you ran away because you were thirsty. Why is that so relevant to the story? What's relevant to the story is that he went after the sheep, <laughs> he made sure the sheep had what it needed, and he brought it back on his shoulder. But Moshe is seen here as somebody who tells something to the sheep. He says there was an ignorance here. I was unaware of something. I was clueless about the fact that you were thirsty. This is somehow an important, indispensable part of the story, which makes Hashem feel that Moshe Rabbeinu is the right leader. I want to share with you today an insight that was presented some years ago by the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Reading this medrash just one layer deeper, we could see ultimately that this is the interpretation of the medrash, but just reading into it a little bit so we can appreciate what our sages are really saying about Moshe Rabbeinu. You know, sheep tend to follow the herd. It says here, Gidi. Now, Gidi is sometimes translated as a goat, but in this context, it can also be translated as the flock. It's part of the, a young animal is often called a Gidi. It says, Moshe Yeroyah, son Yisrael. He was shepherding the flock of Yisrael. So it may have been a goat, it may have been a sheep. Sheep especially tend to follow the herd. In the old expression, <coughs> when you say somebody's a sheep, it means, you know, they just follow the group what we call social conformity. Sheep possess a gregarious instinct, the desire to stay together with the group for protection. You get one sheep to go, and all of them follow. They like to stick together. This sheep, obviously, in defiance of its own nature, deserted the flock. There was a large flock of sheep, and this sheep, as the Medrash puts it, ran away. To quote the exact language, Barach mi menugdi. This individual one ran away. If you're looking at this sheep, it would be very easy to assume that this sheep is really a rotten potato or a rotten tomato. This sheep is a true rebel. It's defying its own instincts, its own natural healthy instincts to be part of the group. It is such a rebel that its rebelliousness is so intense that it's ready to defy its own instincts and jeopardize its own safety, physically jeopardize its safety, just to abandon the flock. But as Moshe pursues this rebel, as Moshe pursues this black sheep in the family, pun intended, this rebellious little animal, Moshe discovers something. And what are his words? I did not know that you ran away because you were thirsty. What is Moshe Rabbeinu saying here? It's almost like he's putting the blame on himself. It's like, I was ignorant. I didn't figure things out. I was looking at it in one way, from one perspective. There's something I didn't know. You were thirsty. You didn't have your water. That's why you ran away. And Moshe is almost blaming himself. Why was I unaware that this sheep ran because it was searching for water? What was I thinking? So as Moshe approaches the animal at the riverbank or at the pond of water, Brecha Shalmayim is a pool of water, and this sheep is, is drinking and quenching its intense, quenching its intense thirst, Moshe Rabbeinu suddenly realizes there was something I didn't know. Because what he suddenly discovers is not a rebellious creature, not an animal that simply has some desire to rebel against law and order and ready to endanger itself. What he really sees is a frightened, thirsty, 
exhausted, sheep in need of immediate attention. He discerns what others might have overlooked, that thoughts of dehydration, not rebellion, drove this tender animal to break from tradition and to leave the community and to leave its natural safe habitat and environment. Thoughts of thirst, of dehydration, not rebellion, are what driving the sheep. It was not receiving from its caretaker, in this case, Moshe Rabbeinu, that which it needed in order to survive, never mind to thrive. So it went off to search for it elsewhere. It's that moment, it's that moment that Hashem knew that he was the person suited to guide and teach and lead and craft the Jewish people into a nation. He would become the role model of what it is to be a Jewish teacher, parent, mentor, leader. And the story would serve as a paradigm, as the parable that would define what Jewish mentorship, pedagogy, fatherhood, motherhood, spiritual leadership would look like throughout the generations. Because what Moshe is teaching us here is how to look at this individual sheep. Instead of blaming the sheep, getting annoyed, frustrated, angry, becoming judgmental, I have so many sheep to take care of in this little chutzpinyak or whatever the right name for a, for, for a sheep. Maybe a chutzpinyak is better for a goat, actually. This shrewd, sly, rebellious goat is now going to take up all my mental space and time. And of course, you give it a couple of fresh, you train it, and you never do this again, which would have been normal. I mean, look what a bad sheep it is to the point that it's ready to endanger itself and do what no other sheep does. How black, how, how, what a black sheep this is. What a foolish sheep this is. What a rebellious sheep this is. What a bad sheep is this. Moshe actually looks the other, looks at it from the opposite perspective. He says, how did I not know? There was something I did not know. The sheep was not receiving what it needed to survive. So maybe it's the other way around. If it would have remained here, it would have died. It wanted to live. It was looking for life. What it was doing, actually, from its perspective, was the healthiest thing. It was actually trying to survive. It was actually doing the right thing. Here, it didn't have its needs. Wow. That's why the Medrash puts in these words. Not just Moshe took the sheep back. Not just Moshe went after the sheep. He's a custodian. He's a responsible man. He's a shepherd. He's a shimer. That's the ethical thing to do. You give me a sheep, I'm responsible to bring it back. I can't come back to the owner and say, oh, one, one, one ran away. Somebody gives me a group of, of, of children, certainly, and even Lahavdal animals, I'm responsible. I can say, oh, one ran away, sorry, I don't know what happened. That's why I hired you. Don't take the job if you don't want to take responsibility for that. That's normal, that's nice, that's good, that's human. That's basic ethics. It's the perspective that Moshe Rabbeinu taught himself and us that made all the difference. How he defined it, how he saw this sheep. Because this is the foundation of all foundations, of leadership of all forms, of education of all forms, of outreach, of inreach, of every age and any demographic and any group. It starts with the simplest things. A child is disturbing in the class. A child is disturbing in the class or at home or in any given situation. There's two responses. One response is, I get angry, I get triggered, I get defensive, and I need to figure out a way how to put this child in his or her place so that this never happens again. What's missing from the equation is the most important thing. Can I try to understand what this child is going through? What are their needs at this moment? What are they experiencing? What is making this situation hard for them? 
Maybe it's as simple as the fact that they're boiling hot. Maybe something going on in the brain. It's hard for this child to sit. Maybe something about their disposition, something about the, their nervous system. Can I be curious? I may not know, but can I acknowledge ignorance? Like Moshe Rabbeinu said, I did not know. I did not know. So instead of blaming the sheep and therefore deciding that I have to crush it and scream at it and, and impose my rules on it to be able to make it fit in, and then what I do is I simply intensify the problem it was trying to avoid, which means the behavior I'm trying to avoid, I actually only intensify in the name of education. I actually want to really tune in to identify and appreciate what is it that this person is going through. And maybe the sheep ran away because it wants that somebody should chase it. Sometimes I see certain behaviors, but do I know how to interpret it? Do I know how to understand it, how to appreciate it? There was a teacher that shared uh, with my wife and I a few weeks ago. She's a teacher in a school here in Muncie. And there was a girl who was really, really misbehaving in class. And the teacher asked her to, uh, to please leave the classroom and she was defiant. And then ultimately she just ran out. The teacher asked her to come back and she would not come back. And the teacher was about to give her a very big penalty. And she was thinking to herself, you know, this such chutzpah, such defiance, such, such an attitude, like so obnoxious, so rude, so not menschlich. She's thinking about all of this. And at that moment, the principal was walking and she saw what's happening. So she asked the student to come to her office. And she said, don't worry, there's no punishment, there's no consequence, I just want to talk to you. And she sat down in the office, gave her a piece of chocolate or gave her a drink or whatever she gave her. And the girl broke down. Her, her mother has cancer and her mother wasn't home. She was constantly going for treatments. So she was just falling apart inside and there was nobody to talk to her. And then the principal shared this with the teacher. And then she realized she was so thankful that she didn't express to this girl what she was thinking, but she realized how, how, how she misread the situation so profoundly. Now, very often the response will be, so what are you supposed to do? Allow everybody to make a commotion in class and destroy the whole class? And that's called really missing the point. <laughs> it's about tuning in to where the person is, how I can help them, and of course, how I can keep all the other sheep safe as well. Why is it that we so often respond instinctively with, with anger, with disdain, with becoming defensive, with trying to fix the situation right now and do whatever we need to force law and order at the expense of the inner soul, the inner psyche, the inner heart of the child? Why is it? And I think the real reason is because we don't do it with ourselves either. You know, what I do, the way I treat myself, the way I treat myself becomes the paradigm of how I treat people. I often don't know in myself and don't realize in myself that when I'm running away, I also need compassion to ask, what am I searching for? What am I yearning for? What am I thirsty for? Why is this place so dangerous? Why do I have to run away physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually? This fellow told me this was such a powerful uh, source of awareness for him. And I'll tell it to you basically in very clear words. He's married. He's married to a wonderful woman. And he's a wonderful guy. But there was something going on in their marriage. And that is every time his wife shared with him a strong opinion about anything. It could be about the president of, well, not the president of the United States, but anything about the family, about the house, about their money, about their children, about himself, about herself, whatever it is. And said something with a certain sense of authority and conviction. He found himself internally freaking out, getting angry, getting upset, 
wanting to run away, becoming judgmental. And throughout many of his years, he was blaming her. You know, a lack of tolerance, a lack of sensitivity, a lack of empathy, a lack of wisdom. And it created a terrible stress in their marriage. After a lot of work on himself, he figured out what we are now became so, which has now became so clear to people working in, 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 in this field of mental health and, and self-awareness and personal growth and spiritual growth, that he was suffering from a serious trauma that he was unaware of. Because very, I'm not using here the word trauma like, you know, my car was towed, so I'm traumatized. Or I missed my airplane, that's a trauma. I'm not talking about that. That's something very annoying and uncomfortable that happens. I'm talking here about something that happens to the brain, actually, where there's a paralysis. Meaning, when he was a child, when he was a child, a certain experience, a certain experiences happened that really what we call in neuroscience ignited or set on fire his amygdala, the stem of the brain, what they call the reptilian brain that is responsible for survival. It's the healthy instincts for survival. When I see confrontation, when I see an adversary, either I fight or I run, I flee, fight or flight, or I freeze. And this is, this, is, this is how you survive. And that fire alarm was set off as a child, but because of the situation, it was never shut down. You know the fire alarm in your house? Nobody ever pressed off. So anything that is even slightly similar to that situation that he experienced creates the same response. Nobody ever told him. He didn't get the memo that he was safe. So when his wife was giving this firm opinion, what he was experiencing is not another person sharing an opinion, but what he was experiencing is, oh my God, my life is in danger. My safety is in danger. That amygdala is still ringing. It's still being ignited. The, alarm, the, al the fire alarm is still sounding. Any trigger, any trigger could be 30 years later. And objectively, nothing really happened. But for that child, his safety was literally, his emotional safety was in jeopardy. Now somebody might come and tell him, you have to work on your midos, you're obnoxious, you're egotistical, you're narcissistic, you're a bad person, you have a terrible Yetzirah. And the truth is, he's a good person. <laughs> he wants to work on himself. He wants to do the right thing. He hates himself for responding this way. The poor guy, because of a lack of self-awareness, doesn't even know that he has another choice. In fact, for him to stay in the presence of the other person emotionally intact doesn't seem like a possibility. He has to run away like this sheep because the water is somewhere else. Here I'm going to die from thirst. I'm going to die from danger. So somebody who's not experiencing this doesn't even understand it. What, 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 what's the problem? But for this person who's living in a much narrower, restricted place, not in a safe place. This is what's happening. And the first thing that needs to happen is the awareness and the compassion for this process that is happening in my brain or in your brain or in his brain or in her brain. In the words of Moshe, I didn't know how much danger you were feeling. And that's why you ran away. Because when there is that awareness, now suddenly... I could look at it with compassion and then perhaps make a choice and say, but now I am safe. I don't have to respond this way. I don't have to emotionally run away. I don't have to attack. I don't have to freeze. I can assuage, assuage my fears and allow other parts of my brain, what we call the limbic brain, the emotional brain, the neo, the prefrontal cortex brain, to be able to remain active in this relationship and in this communication. I don't have to go into that danger zone, but I, nobody told me. When a person can start living this way within themselves, when you can start having compassion on your own little sheep and goat that's running away, it looks like a really bad rebel, the troublemaker inside of you, the part that's getting annoyed, frustrated, depressed, 
angry, full of vengeance or hate or revenge or animosity or divisiveness, whatever it may be. Melancholy, dejection, terrible, terrible ire. This terrible troublemaker in you is acting up again. This Yetzirah that you have, this evil beast in you, once again is wreaking havoc in your psyche and in your family. The way you respond to this one or that one. But when you could stop, or I could stop, and like Moshe Rabbeinu say, can I be curious, what is this goat or sheep looking for? Everybody has a different type of reptile. <laughs> this one has a sheep, this one has a goat, this one has an ox, this one is, has an insect, this one has an elephant, this one has a lion. The lion at one point was a little cub, a cute little cub. But it grows monstrous, but can I be curious and say, what are you really looking for? What are you afraid of? What are you searching for? What are you trying to protect? What are you trying to protect? This emotion that's coming out is not as bad as you think it is. It's actually a bodyguard. It's trying to protect something. You're afraid that if this emotion doesn't emerge, if this sheep doesn't run away right now, this sheep says, I'm out of here. I'm not connected to you. You're going to die from thirst. You're trying to protect yourself. You're trying to protect something very precious. It's called life. Can you figure out what you're trying to protect? What are you trying to safeguard? And when you realize that, instead of judging it, you can actually say, wow, you were trying to help me. You didn't want that one of my sheep should die. You were doing me a favor. You actually were trying to help me. Thank you. And you're exhausted and you're frightened. Come on my shoulder. And I'm sorry that I did not know what was going on. Moshe apologizes to this sheep. It's almost like, apologize? Chutzpah! What apologize? A bigger penalty. Apologize? Chutzpah! Who apologizes? You don't do that. But somehow, the greatest prophet of all time can apologize, not to a child, to a sheep. <laughs> not to a child, to a sheep. Who apologizes to a sheep? To a goat? Because you're a Meshuggah a sheep? Because you're a rebel? Because you're a Russia? Because the Yitzhah is out of whack? He says, I, I didn't know. And he can do that. He can do that. Because he can do it to himself. We can do it to ourselves. And when I can do it to myself, and I can ask, what is it that I'm trying to protect? And I could look at that. And then I can go to step two and say, wow. And maybe I can bring safety to my inner sheep, to my inner goat, to my inner child. Without these bodyguards, I think Churchill once said in a time of war, the truth is so precious that it needs many bodyguards of lies to protect it. So my truth is precious and I have to protect it. And therefore I need to disassociate. I can't remain present. I have to disassociate. I have to freeze. I have to disconnect. It's too much. The Sunday night, I had a session on uh, Let's Get Real with Coach Menachem and Usher Parnas with Rabbi Shimon Russell, who was a therapist in Lakewood for like 30 years and then moved to Yerushalayim recently. And he's been seeing teenagers, basically, young teenagers, older teenagers, boys and girls within the religious community, what you would call the Orthodox Jewish community, for 32 years. Day and night, or at least large, par par parts, of the large parts of the night and much of the day. And I asked him a question. I said, how many teenagers have you seen over the years? A hundred, a thousand, ten thousand. He says, thousands upon thousands upon thousands. So I said, what did you learn in these 32 years? All the sheep that have ran away. <laughs> they have ran away from the system. They have ran away from the groups, from their group. They have ran away from their families, physically or emotionally or ideologically or spiritually. What have you learned and are there exceptions? So he says, all my years I have learned, and I quote, 32 years of experience, and somebody in the thicket of Lakewood and now in Yerushalayim, dealing with many communities and all demographics, the Hasidic world and the Litvish world and the Yeshivish world, we'd call the modern Orthodox world, uh, more Yeshivish, very Yeshivish, this type of Hasidic group, that type of, mamish, all the groups within the Orthodox community. 
And he said, the bottom line is, I learned one thing, <laughs> that there was not one person who ever left their father and their mother and their family and their Yiddishkeit. And I could not identify something deeply broken in their own core beliefs about themselves. Or to put it in his words, they had to disconnect from a source that was causing them so much pain. So consciously or unconsciously, he told me they did the best thing they can do, survive, try to survive. So I'm screaming at the sheep, you're wicked, you're a Russia. You're a terrible, terrible person. You're a terrible, terrible creature. But Moshe says, sorry, I didn't know. I didn't give you what you needed. I didn't provide it to you. Moshe says this, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. You know how many sheep I have to run? I have a school, I have a family, I have a community, I have a bunch of children. Moshe should have said, you have 10,000 sheep here. You have problems, figure it out. I'll say to Hillam for you. Moshe says, I took responsibility for you. I brought you to the world. You're in my school, you're in my home, you're my child. You're my student, you're my disciple. I didn't give you the water you needed. For you to stay here would mean death from starvation or from hydration, from thirst or from exhaustion, from dehydration. You weren't hydrated. So the person often feels that for me to stay connected, it is so tra traumatizing, I have to disconnect. And sometimes I disassociate emotionally from myself. I have to detach from my own emotions because to remain in my emotions would have been too painful. So I have to sever the cord to my own emotions. I become a cerebral scientist and all my philosophies follow suit in order to justify my existence. And I'm doing the best I can to cope. I'm looking for water. So my instinctive response is judgmental. Why are you ruining my life? You're destroying my life. You're ruining everybody's life. How bad can you be? And how bad was I? Well, what did I do? We have a be beautiful Fabreng in here with all the sheep. Tomorrow's going to be chocolate cake. Shabbos is going to be sushi. Shalosh will have potato chips. What do you want? Why do I do that? Why do I do that? Because I myself am threatened. <laughs> You're triggering me in a very deep way. I myself have to run away. I can't deal with it. What does Moshe teach us? Be curious. Go after the person, go out of your comfort zone, reach into their heart, not just physically, spiritually, emotionally, and say, Shefala, Shefala, my dear Shefala, share with me, what are you searching for? What did you need? Now this sheep at this point may not want to talk to me. And I have to be curious about that too. And then I have to go into me and ask myself, what did I not know? What was I ignorant of? And then I realized that this sheep actually was the greatest gift in my life because it made me self-aware in a way that no other sheep could have made me self-aware. It's this sheep that gave the world Moshe Rabbeinu. Thank God for the sheep that ran away. If not for the sheep that ran away, we would have never had Moshe Rabbeinu. What made Moshe Moshe? Not the other sheep, that sheep. That the sheep that made Moshe say, I was so unaware. Wow, thank you for opening me up to truth. Thank you for making me grow. Thank you for asking me, for challenging me to go deeper into myself and really liberate myself from my own narrow judgmentalism and restrictive modes and develop a real relationship with Hashem that is expansive, that is infinite, that is authentic, that is raw, that is vulnerable, in which I don't have to deem you as evil, as defiant, as horrible, but rather tune in and try to ask myself, what were you searching for that I could not give you? And then put you on my shoulder and say, and now you will teach me the way back and I will teach you the way back. We'll hold hands, don't walk in front of me because I may not follow, don't walk behind me because I may not lead, let's walk together side by side, metaphorically, he takes him on his shoulder and says, let's, let's, let's walk together. Let's go back together. In Budapest, in Hungary, 
And I want to thank uh, Rabbi Sh a friend of mine, Rabbi Schneir Ashkenazi, for sharing the story in the context of this discussion. There's a Jew who I know, he's a Chabad Shliach, a Chabad ambassador in Budapest, in Hungary. His name is Rabbi Shlomo Kovish. He himself is a Hungarian Jew who became a Balchuva. He returned to Yiddishkeit. He grew up in Hungary, and now he's a rabbi serving the community in Budapest. He is the leader of what's called Igud Yehude Hungaria, which is the, the organization of, of the Jews of Hungary, combining the Jews, uniting the Jews of Hungary. 12 or 13 years ago, Rabbi Shlomo Kovish receives a telephone call. It was a strange call. A real estate broker is on the phone. He introduces himself and he says, would you like to purchase a beautiful shul in Budapest? Budapest is, not big, Budapest is not Muncie, it's not Borough Park, it's not Lakewood, it's not Yerushalayim, it's certainly not Bnei Brak or Kea Sefer, and also not Golders Green or Stamford Hill. They're selling shuls in Budapest. Who wants to sell a shul in Budapest? And the man says that in the third quarter, what's called the quarter, one of the beautiful quarters of Budapest, the third quarter, there was a beautiful mansion that one of the Hungarian kings of old used to bring visitors to come to this uh, palace. It was considered one of the wonders of the city. Splendid views, splendid environment, and this is where he would welcome his guests. And if you go to the eastern side of this beautiful mansion, you'll see that there is a structure of an Oren Kaidish. On top of it, there's a portrait of a flame of a mountain that's on fire with a cloud with a picture of the Ten Commandments. Because it used to be a palace, it was used for a shul, beautiful, beautiful shul. In the 1960s, the communist regime seized the shul and turned it into the central TV network of the national TV station. It was all national because, you know, it's a communist regime. So this became the main broadcasting center of the national TV. Now, the television network is leaving and they want to sell it. What's the price? The price was approximately 3 million, three at the time, 12, 13 years ago, around $3 million. If you're ready to sign right now, I'll give you a nice discount. The rabbi says, can I come see the place? He says, sure. He comes into the place and it was tragic. You could see that it was once a shul. You know, you go to Eastern Europe and you see these places. It was once a shul and not just a shul, but something out of this world. But there was no zeicher for it, no memory of it. It was a real television uh, network station. He couldn't afford to buy it, even a down payment and a mortgage. So he said, would you rent it? Till you find a buyer, can I rent it? Yeah, you could rent it. And in the meantime, I'll try to find money and be able to buy it. He says, for Rosh Hashanah, I want to be able to use it already. They said, fine, we're not using it. Great. So he started to rent it. And Rosh Hashanah, he announced that the tefillahs are going to be there. And a big crowd came. And it was really an extraordinary space. He had to convert it do some renovation, but they started to daven there. Two weeks after he opened the shul, two weeks after Rosh Hashanah, rumors circulated around town that Rabbi Shlomo Kovish opened the shul there. He gets a call and he sees on the caller ID, it's a 212 telephone number. Why is somebody calling him from Manhattan to Budapest? So you know a good rabbi's dream, he's already imagining some donor that was sent to him from heaven and say, you know, I decided I want to give you a few million dollars to buy the shul. Who knows, maybe somebody living in the country of Uncle Sam, where the streets are paved with gold, is calling him to give him a down payment to be able to buy the shul. He answers the phone. The man on the other line says, Rabbi Kovish, first thing I want you to know is, I'm a bad Jew. That's the... <laughs> That's the opening, Shalom Aleich. The first thing you should know is, I'm a bad Jew. 60 years, I haven't stepped foot into 
a synagogue into a shul. And in principle, due to my principles, I wouldn't even go eat in a kosher restaurant. Not only won't I walk into a shul, I won't walk into a kosher restaurant. That's how bad a Jew I am. No, Rabbi Shlomo Kovich, Chabad Shliach, so what's his response? There's no such a thing as a bad Jew. I don't accept it. So now they get into an argument if there's such a thing as a bad Jew. He says yes, and I'm the poster boy for a bad Jew. And the rabbi is telling him there's no such a thing. He says, this is my identity. You want to continue the conversation? Or I should hang up. He says, okay, Sean, <laughs> you're a bad Jew. What's now? And the man says as follows. There's a newspaper that comes out from the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And I'm a subscriber. And I see that this shul that hasn't been used since the 1960s was now rented by you. And you dive in the Rosh Hashanah. And I want you to know when I read this story, I was moved. Why? Because this is the shul where my parents davened, and that's where my bar mitzvah was. And I feel it would be appropriate as you're renovating the shul to put up a plaque in the shul in the memory of my father and mother who prayed there and bar mitzvahed me in this shul. So Rabbi Kovar says, sure, it would be an honor and a pleasure. And he said, who knows, he'll begin with a plaque and then maybe, you know, he'll name the whole building. So of course, the second question is, and what do you do? He says, uh, you know, he was hoping, you know, I own the Fifth Avenue, half of Fifth Avenue. He says, I'm an electrician. So, okay. So he's thinking to himself, it's going to be a plaque, shine. Where do you work? He says, I'll tell you, you know, I uh, did the whole electricity in the Kennedy Airport, Kennedy International Airport. I had 300 employees, and we're the ones who arranged the electricity in the whole Kennedy Airport. In fact, some years ago, I also bought a hotel in Budapest. I said, oh, he's not a regular electrician. <laughs> he's a grand electrician. And uh, who knows, there may be some very good news. So my cover says, why don't you come down to Budapest? We'll make a beautiful evening in the show. I'll prepare the plaque, you'll give me the names, and in honor of hanging the plaque, you'll be here with the community, and it'll be a wonderful evening. He says, fine, he comes to Budapest, he makes a beautiful dinner in the shul, he prepares a beautiful plaque to hang, plaque to hang up in the shul in honor of this person's parents, and uh, they're sitting at the meal, the Jew is not saying a word, this fellow. Finally, he says, do you want to say something? So he gets up and this is what he says. Rabbi, you remember the first time we had a conversation, I introduced you, I introduced myself to you and I told you, I'm a bad Jew. He says, yes, I remember. You know how I became a bad Jew? He says, no. So let me tell you, during the war, I lost everybody. I survived and I had a sister who survived. We were two orphans. Both of us miraculously survived. There was nobody else in the family. We were Budapest Jews, but everybody was murdered. My father, my mother, siblings, uncles, aunts, everybody was murdered. Me and my sister survived. One day after the war, I'm walking in Budapest and I meet an old Jew. He was the old rabbi of this shul who survived the war. A lot of Jews in Budapest happened to survive because of the last policies of Eichmann. Most of Hungarian Jews were murdered, but there was a significant amount of Jews in Budapest to survive. This rabbi happened to survive. And the rabbi recognized me because I was by mitzvah in his shul. And he looks at me and he says, Krember Moritz's son is alive? My father's name was Krember Moritz, Maurice. Kramber Moritz's son is alive. Wow. He gives me a warm embrace, a warm hug, and he says, soon as Rosh Hashanah, maybe you come to the shul on Rosh Hashanah, your shul, your father's shul, your mother's shul. I said, yeah. I was an orphan. I was a teenager, and I had nobody. So I wasn't so comfortable, but he invited me. So I went to the shul. This is the big shul in Budapest that we used before the war, and we got it back after the war. It's a big door, 
as you see here, he's talking in that shul. And I knock on the door, and uh, the person who's running the shul opens the door and says, do you have a ticket? You need a ticket. I say, I don't have a ticket. He says, well, you have to buy a ticket in order to get into shul. I was very ashamed. I said, listen, I'm an orphan. I don't have anything. I lost my family. I don't have any money. I don't have any money to buy a ticket. So the man says, I'm sorry, without a ticket, you can't come in. I told him, go ask the rabbi. The rabbi gave me a personal invitation. He said I should come. Rabbi Aher, Rabbi Ahin. The synagogue has a policy. If you don't buy a ticket, you can't come into the services. He closed the door on me. At that moment, I was so hurt. It wasn't just that I couldn't go into shul. This was my shul. This is why I was my mitzvah. I lost my parents. The rabbi invites me. I felt so betrayed. I made a resolution. I'm never going to step foot in to this place. And I'm never going to step foot into a shul. Because somebody who doesn't accept me without a ticket, I will not enter into such a place even when I have money and I have a ticket. Not only that, I'm not even going to go into a kosher restaurant because I don't want to have anything to do. When I read in the newspaper that this shul came back to life and these memories came back as an old man, I say to myself, my parents loved this shul. Let me put a plaque for them. When the first thing you told me is there's no such a thing as a bad Jew, <laughs> I argued with you, but you argued back and you refused to surrender your position. I can't thank you enough for reconnecting me with the shul of my mother and my father. So here you have a classic example, a classic example, a sheep who ran away so far. What did Moshe Rabbeinu teach? Look into yourself and ask yourself, what is this sheep searching for? And then instead of labeling it as a Russia, as a rebel, as a bad Jew, you'll actually label it as a thirsty Jew. And not only will you not see the negativity, but this is one step deeper. You might find that what this sheep went to do was actually something so positive because it was trying to live. It was trying to help Moshe and it was trying to help itself. You will find that this search of this person, this kid was trying to protect himself. He was trying to save himself. He was trying to save his honor, to save his dignity from this person. Now that person behaved to, to him this way because of his own issues, whatever they are. I'm not now analyzing the shamash of that shul and why he did it that way. You know, there's an old joke that happened in Manhattan once. I don't know if it's a joke, but one guy comes to a shul on Rosh Hashanah, one of the big temples, and he comes and he knocks on the door and the guard says, do you have a ticket? He says, no, 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 no. I didn't come here to the prayer, the sermon. My sister is in the synagogue. I need to tell her something. Can you let me go in for a few minutes? Tell her something, I go out. He says, you have to have a ticket. He says, that's to pray. I didn't come to pray. I came to talk to my sister. He says, okay, I'll let you in, but I better not catch you praying. <laughs> yeah, it's an old joke, but it's a good one. Because sometimes you want to know, you know, what's the mission statement of synagogues, right? <laughs> I better not catch you praying. Moshe Rabbeinu, to be a leader of the Jewish people, you have to understand right away. If you're going to start making the differentiations between us and them, we're the good sheep, they're the bad sheep. We're the white sheep, they're the black sheep. We're the fresh potatoes, they're the rotten potatoes. We're the delicious tomatoes, they are the moldy tomatoes. We're the real Jews, they're the fake Jews. We are the holier-than-thou Jews. They're the bad, goyim. A Moshe Rabbeinu you can't be. You can't be a Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Hayaraya. To be a Raya Ma'amna, to be a shepherd of the Jewish people, you have to transcend that mindset. It's not easy, because if I transcend it, am I sacrificing my religiosity? Am I sacrificing my Judaism? Am I lowering my standards? But Moshe taught, you're hiring your standards. Your standards are becoming so authentic, so real, that instead of responding from a place of ego, you're responding from a place of divinity. 
from a place of infinite love, from a place of infinite compassion. You're becoming more Jewish, not less Jewish. If you, you can't become more Jewish, you're becoming more in touch with your true Jewishness by having the ability to look at that sheep who will expand your horizons and make you more divine and not less divine. You know, throughout uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, at the end of his life, uses a very sharp expression with the Jewish people in Dvarim more than once. He says, Mamrim heyisem im Hashem. Mamrim heyisem im Hashem means, he says, from the day I know you, you have been uh, Mamrim, you have been um, Mamrim, rebellious. In Yiddish, it's Vider Speneke, Vider Spenekung. You were a betrayer, you were betrayers, you were traitors, you were always fighting him, opposing him. So the Meha Shiloyach, the Ishbitzer Rebbe, says grammatically it's incorrect. He should say, Mamrim Hayisem Neged Hashem. You rebelled against God. He doesn't say that. He says, Mamrim Hayisem Im Hashem. You rebelled with God. It doesn't make sense. It's like, you're such a rebel against. Don't tell me with. But that's what Moshe Rabbeinu was telling the Jewish people. I know you're, re- re- you, I know you're, re- I know you're about your rebellion. But don't think for a moment that I ever saw your rebellion as a sign that you're against. I always understood that your rebellion was coming from a relationship that you're searching for, from something that is destroying you inside, from something that you're not, fe- you're not feeling safe, for something, an existential or an emotional crisis. I have to heal you, that's my responsibility. I'm gonna put you on my shoulder and bring you back. But I never thought that you were against Mamrim Hayisem Im Hashem, one of the glorious statements of a leader who was first authenticated and chosen because of his view on the sheep. And if you want to see how vivid this plays itself out, I'm going to show it to you in two stories. So you'll see here how the interconnection between Torah. If you go back to your source sheet, if you need one there on the Bima, the second source, Yalkut Shemoyni B'Shalach. The Jews are about to cross the sea, the Egyptians are behind them, the Red Sea is in front of them. The angel Samoil, we call him the Samachmem, comes down and says, God, the Jews were engaged in pagan idolatry in Egypt. Why are they getting miracles? And Samoil is speaking to the spiritual energy of the sea that split. And the sea gets so angry, and the sea says, you know what, I'm going to drown them. Why should I drown the Egyptians? Let me drown them first. Then we'll drown the Egyptians. That's why it says, V'hamayim lahem chayma meminam u'mesmailam. Chayma without a vav. It should have said, V'hamayim lahem chayma. The water was a fortress, but the water was chayma. The water was angry. V'hamayim lahem chayma. The water was angry. Furious at the Jewish people. Miyad hei shiv loya kadosh baruchu. Hashem responds to the angel Samar. Listen to God's words. Shai, he, Hashem is not being diplomatic. I'm just warning you. You know what shaita shebiyolam means? Huh? You never heard this from your Zayda? Everybody knows what a shaita means. Shaita You're not just stupid. You get the Nobel Prize for stupidity. Shaita shebiyolam means a world-renowned fool. Somebody who has achieved great stature in their foolishness, in their stupidity, in their cluelessness. Why is Hashem calling an angel Shaita Shabaylam? It's your angel. Shaita <laughs> Shabaylam. Doesn't even say Russia. Shaita. You're an idiot. You're a moron. You're a Shaita. You're a fool. You're an imbecile. Why? Vechiladaitam of Dua? You think their worship of idolatry was conscious? Deliberate? Vailailai of Dua, Lamitach Shibud, Umitach Tiruv Das. They were engaged in pagan idolatry because they were slaves. They were subjugated. Tiruv Das. Their prefrontal cortex was not intact. Their Das was confused. They were confused people. They were overwhelmed people. They were trying to survive. They were not thinking. They did not have the cerebral capacity to think through their life from a mature, developed, Deep, intuitive, wise, emotionally connected stance. By you, mistakes are seen as deliberate acts, and people who are forced are seen as malicious and vicious. 
Hashem didn't deny what they did. He said, but you're lacking perspective. You have to know who these people are. Scene number two. They cross the sea. They get the Torah. Forty days later, they create a new idol, a calf. They're dancing around the calf. Moshe comes down with the luchus. And as he comes down, what happens? He hears the sounds of the orgies, the crazy chaos that was going around as the Jews were dancing around their new golden calf. Take a look next source. Talmud Yerushalmi, Tainus Perik Dalar Alachahe. The Pasik says in Kisisa, Vayishma Yoshua Skoila Umbireya. Yoshua heard the voice of the nation in its triumphant sound, screaming, hollering, dancing, celebrating. Yahushua was, of course, waiting at the mountain's feet for his master to come down. For el Moshe tells Moshe, Koil Mulchama Bamachana, I hear the sounds of war in the camp. Vayoimer Moshe says to him, Ain Koil Anois Gvura, Vain Koil Anois Chalusha, Koil Anois Anoichi Shemeya. Moshe says, I do not hear the sounds of the victors. I don't even hear the sounds of the losers, of those who were defeated. I don't hear the sound of strength of those who came out triumphant. I don't hear the sounds of people who are suffering defeat. What I hear is the sound of pain. A noise from the word inui, v'inisem, affliction. Now listen to the words of the Yerushalmi. The obvious question is, what's the point of this exchange? Moshe was coming down. He's soon going to see the calf. He's going to break the tablets. That's the story. What's the point in, in Torah? There's no just stories, conversations. What's the point of this conversation? Yeshua identified the sounds as the sounds of war. In other words, Moshe, there's danger. And Moshe says, no, 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 no. I don't hear defeat. I don't hear victory. I hear pain. What's the point? Says the Gemara, Omar Moshe. This is an unbelievable teaching of the Gemara. Omar Moshe. Moshe told Yeshua. Adam show asid lahanig shrara al shishim riboy enu yedeya lahafchin ben koil lekoil. A person who's destined to become the leader over six hundred thousand Jews, and that's just males between twenty and sixty. Then you have young, you have senior citizens, you have females. A person who's going to lead a nation of millions doesn't know how to distinguish between one sound. And another sound. Moshe was giving his student his training. You're telling me this is a voice of war? There is a rebellion here against God? There's a betrayal of everything? That's what you're telling me? If you're going to be a leader, you're going to have to know the difference between coil and coil. Sometimes two people can be screaming. Can you hear the difference between coil and coil? Can you hear the difference? Somebody is cursing. Somebody's saying terrible things. Somebody's behaving in such a difficult way. But if you're a leader, if you're not a victim, if you're a confident, loving leader, parent, mentor, can you hear what is behind the voice? What is behind the sound? Can you hear that this is not a voice of somebody who's trying to win? And it's not even the voice of somebody who lost who's trying to get revenge, who's trying to just express themselves. It's actually the voice of anois. It's the voice of inui, of affliction, of pain. How can a manhig not know the difference? What do you mean he's screaming? She's cursing, he's screaming. I understand. But if you're a manhig, if you're a victim, you become part of the problem. You get sucked in to the pain and affliction and you don't become a source of help. Am I part of the solution or am I part of the problem? But if I'm a leader, I have to be able to identify and say, this is pain. There's a lot of pain here. And that's not comfortable because then I have to ask myself, what did I not give this sheep? I was the caretaker. I am the caretaker. What did I not get? And therefore, what could I not give? And then it's a different response. Now when Moshe comes down, he doesn't turn it around and say, oh, it's all wonderful and rosy. The Jews are just having a malava malka. He doesn't do that. He breaks the luchas. He goes up and he has to plead and fight with the Rebbeinu Shalom for forgiveness. 
But he understood that at the core of everything is you have to identify and zoom in and tune into the anois and lift up from there, educate from there, discipline from there, communicate from there, penalize also, but only from there. That's why he told Yeshua, you are misdiagnosing the sounds. You are completely misreading the voices. What do we say on Rosh Hashanah? The mitzvah is not to blow, the mitzvah is to hear the koil. And David HaMelech tells us in Tehillim, Shira Malas mi ma'amakim k'rasicha Hashem, Adonai shima b'koyli, tiyena oznecha kashuvus l'kol tachanunai. So the Balatanya asks in L'kut HaTorah, grammatically it should say, Hashem shima l'koyli. Right? Listen to my voice. Shima l'koyli. Listen to my voice. He says, no. Don't listen to my voice. Shima b'koyli. Could you listen to what's inside my voice? Not to my voice, bikaili. Inside, go inside. What is inside? What is behind the voice? What is the sheep searching for, yearning for? Moshe was now giving over to Yahushua at that fateful moment, the worst moment of Jewish, one of the worst, lowest moments of Jewish history. And Yahushua said, Look at them, they're busy fighting God. And he said, it's at these moments where you have to be the leader. And for you to be the leader, you have to know the difference between koil and koil. Right now, he was giving over the mantle, even though it would be still another 40 years. Moshe would get his, Yeshua would get his training again and again and again. Later in Baalois, there would be a very interesting exchange between him and Moshe. But it all began that moment when he shepherded the flock. And he taught the Jewish people forever that instead of being judgmental, instead of being angry, instead of being frustrated, I have to be perceptive, understanding, curious, loving, proud, committed, dedicated. I always want to follow the clues that will lead me to the underlying goodness sweetness, genuineness of the human being. Where others see mutiny, I will see restlessness. Where other people see insubordination, I will see an expression of the desire to survive, to excel, to find happiness, to live, to grow. Can I look at myself through the mirror of responsibility and awareness? rather than look at others through the window of culpability and vindictiveness. That makes all the difference. And that's why Moshe was chosen to be the eternal mentor of the Jewish people. Have a wonderful week.